from Lagos, the nation's commercial capital. This is the News at 10. Live from Channels Television. Reporting tonight, Amarachi Ubani. Tonight, still crying for help, parents of 20 abducted students of Greenfield University, Kaduna, appeal to the government to assist them in rescuing their children from captivity. In Obong Moray, the victim of a job scam is buried in her hometown in Akwaibom as police parade her suspected killer. More reactions trail the southern governor's resolution banning open grazing of cattle. Governor Tom says decision will end farmer herder crisis. And Israel and Palestine conflict deepens as violent clashes between Israel and Gaza militants spread to more towns. Plus business, sports, news from Abuja and later international news from our London studio. On business news tonight, Nigeria boosts natural gas development with $6.9 billion investment deals in 2020. On sports news tonight, FIFA confirms Manchester City defender Emeric Laporte has been approved to play for Spain instead of France at next month's Euro Championships. And from the nation's capital, electoral materials destroyed as fire guts another independent National Electoral Commission office, the third in less than two weeks. are not giving up until our children return home. That's the resolve of the aggrieved parents of the remaining 20 students abducted from the Greenfield University in Kaduna State. They're appealing to the federal government to come to their aid. At one of the regular meetings and prayer sessions, the parents reveal that the kidnappers are insisting on collecting 100 million naira as ransom, even after they had collectively paid them over 60 million naira. The students were abducted on April 20th. These are aggrieved parents of the 20 abducted students of Greenfield University in Kaduna State. The expressions on their faces clearly shows the trauma and nightmare they've endured since the abduction of their children on April 20th. A total of 20 students and three staff members of the private university were kidnapped. A few days later, the bandits killed five of the students with a threat to kill the rest if their parents and government failed to pay 800 million naira ransom. While one of the students was later released about two weeks ago after his parents reportedly paid ransom for his release, the fate of the remaining students still hangs in the balance. It's been 24 days of nightmare and emotional trauma for their parents who've been meeting on a daily basis to discuss ways of ensuring their safe return. Having spent over 60 million naira to pay ransom to the kidnappers for the release of their children without any success, these parents, both Christians and Muslims, have now resorted to prayers to seek for God's intervention. Woman. Chairman of the aggrieved parents, Marka Zamai, wants the president, Muhammadu Buhari, to use his office to secure the release of the students. This is the 24 day they are in captives, harmless, with nobody to stand in for them. That is why we feel we should come to the media. We should come and call on the federal government, the state government, well-spirited individual, to call on all private and uh, organization, religious leaders, to come to our rescue. You can just imagine the pain we are passing through. These children have not done anything wrong. They went there to study, but they were kidnapped. And all effort as parents, we've sold all that we own, all that God has given us to be able to rescue them, but to no avail. Our money has been taken by these kidnappers, and they refuse to let our children go. And we are calling because this fight is beyond us. 
You can see this girl in front of me. Today making 24 days. She has not seen her mother. She has been crying that she wants to see her mother. She's helpless. We don't know what to do. Let the government come to help us. Please, we are begging. Each time they call, we beg and they keep on telling us that they don't have problem with us. They have problem with the government. That the government should talk to them. That they don't have any problem with us. We keep begging them. We keep begging every day if they call, we beg. That they don't have problem with us. That they have problem with the federal government. So let the federal government go to talk to them so that they can release our child for us. It's not only the parents of the students that are feeling the pain. Little Esther Chukemeka is appealing to the bandits to release her mother. <laughs> I want my mom to come back. <laughs> she was kidnapped. <laughs> Daddy should release my mommy. It is important that every Nigerian should have confidence in their government. And government has a responsibility to protect its people. That is our call. That is our earnest desire that God, or our federal government, under the able leadership of our president, should come to our aid to release our children, our wives, from those who have taken them captive. Mass kidnappings of students in Nigeria for ransom payments have been on the increase in Kaduna State in recent times, with the state government insisting it'll neither negotiate nor pay any money to the kidnappers. But for these parents, what is paramount to them at the moment is to see the safe return of their children. Heartbreaking indeed. Some other stories now. The resolutions reached by the governors of the southern states, now known as the Asaba Accord, is still generating reactions, this time from a governor from the north central state. Governor Samuel Otom of Benue State believes that those opposed to the ban on open grazing have ulterior motives. According to him, the Northern Governors Forum recently banned open grazing and no one came at them as they are now attacking governors from the south. Governor Tom was speaking at the Makodi Catholic Diocese Communication Week where he said those opposed to the decision of the Southern Governors as a, a people have ulterior motives. I want to also use this opportunity to appreciate my colleagues and the people of the southern part of Nigeria, 17 governors coming together to adopt ranching as the global best practice and the best practice in the southern Nigeria. I commend them. I appreciate them. You have not done anything strange. It is what we started in 2016. And it is what also the Northern Governors Forum met some time ago and adopted. That moving forward in this country, we must adopt ranching. If you have land in your state and you think you can accommodate open grazing, you are free to do that. So it is not anything strange. I'm surprised that some people have taken to criticize and to castigate Southern governors. Southern governors have not done anything wrong. You have done the right thing. Anybody that is castigating them for coming together to say that it is no longer feasible to do open grazing in Nigeria, then we should ranch our cattle. Anyone who is castigating you is an evil man or woman with a hidden agenda. And so I stand united and I support ranching as pronounced by southern governors and also some of my colleagues in the northern governors forum a senior advocate of nigeria mr femi falano has also been highlighting the constitutional grounds on which decisions reached by the southern state governors specifically the ban on open grazing stand on Mr. Falano describes the arguments in some quarters that the governor's decision cannot be justified under the Land Use Act as a divide and rule tactics designed to further polarize the masses of our people. He explains that the decision of all the governors, including those from the northern states who were the first to ban open grazing, is in line with Section 1 of the Land Use Act, which, was, which has vested the entire land in every state in the governors on behalf of the people. He has that any person or corporate body that wishes to use land in any state is required to apply for a certificate of occupancy issued by the governor who has the power to approve the physical planning of the land in every state. Concerning forest reserves, Mr. Falano's statements reads in part, 
The reserves owned by state governments are equally regulated by laws enacted by the Houses of Assembly. And under such laws, it is stipulated that it is a criminal offence to occupy any part of such reserve without authorization of the state government. He explains that as far back as 2016, the Buhari administration had adopted ranching in place of open grazing on farmlands without the authorization of the owners. According to him, due to the pressure from some selfish interest groups, the federal government abandoned the policy of ranching. According to him, every citizen is entitled to the fundamental right to freedom of movement and right to own and acquire land in any part of Nigeria by virtue of sections 41 and 43 of the Nigerian constitution respectively. To that extent, herders, like other citizens, are at liberty to acquire land for cattle business under the Land Use Act. He concluded by saying that those who are encouraging herders to reject modern animal husbandry are advised to learn from Botswana, South Africa, Mozambique, Kenya and Ethiopia that have effectively adopted ranching to end clashes between herders and farmers. Meanwhile, the House of Representatives has said the Speaker, Femi Bajabiamila, did not oppose the recent resolutions of the Southern Governors Forum after its meeting in Asaba, the Delta State Capital. Chairman of the House Committee on Media and Public Affairs, Benjamin Karu, explains that the House, under Bajabiamila's leadership, had always been an, an advocate of reviewing of the 1999 Constitution. He explains that the allegations are attributed to statements made by the Speaker at a recent interview seeking his opinion on the issue. The House states clearly and unequivocally that the publications are false and misleading. The statement explains that the Speaker only called for the need for everyone to come together to make sure that we resolve whatever issues there are and that the greatest nations have gone through challenges worse than what Nigeria is currently confronting. Afeni Ferry leader Chief Ayo Adibanjo is asking President Mahmoudou Buhari to initiate the process for the restructuring of the country to the path of true federalism ahead of the 2023 general elections. He said this uh, in his maiden address uh, as the new leader of the social political group after their meeting in Odobolu local government area of Ogun State. Chief Adibanjo says only restructuring the country back to true federalism can guarantee unity and save the country from disintegration. It is cheering that call for the social is no longer limited to a very, very fun day and maybe day for work. The Northern Aiders Forum and the Wife of Society Forum have joined the crusade. I'm very, very welcome and endorse fully the resolution of the Southern Governors Forum. And we hope the Arab worry in the interest of Nigeria unity, peace, tranquility, and economic progress gives serious attention to the recommendation. Finally, we are worry to bury the idea of holding elections before it's only to federalism. By restructuring the country now, there must be a country before the election is held. It will be patriotic of him to heed this advice. If General Buhari is sincere about keeping the country together, he must restructure the country now. This is the only answer to all the disintegration of the country. To save Nigeria, to serve the country now. Another senator who's lending his voice of the security situation in the country is Danjima Goje, representing Gombe Central in the National Assembly. He describes the current situation as very bad and that the country needs prayers and urgent measures to, be, to bring the situation under control. The security situation in the country is very bad. And we're praying to Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, to bring an end to this serious danger that we're in. And I want to say the National Assembly and the presidency and all concerned are doing everything possible to arrest the situation. The president has, um, last week, he had a uh, lengthy meeting, series of meetings, 
particularly with the service chiefs and other security officers. He has so many, he has so many hours devoted to this meeting, security, national security meeting. And we on our own part of the National Assembly, we had a lengthy, more than four hour session with all the security chiefs of the country. All these are geared towards finding a lasting solution and bringing this serious security menace to our heart. In part two after the break, troops intensify fight against banditry in Kaduna State. The state government says several gunmen killed in operations in two local government areas. Welcome back. If it has joined us, you're watching the news at 10 live on channels, television, Lagos. A reminder of our top stories. Still crying for help, parents of 20 abducted students of Greenfield University, Kaduna, appeal to the government to assist them in rescuing their children from captivity. In Yobong Moring, a victim of a job scam is buried in her hometown in Akwaibong as police parade her suspected killer. More reactions trail the Southern Governor's resolution banning open grazing of cattle. Governor Tom says decision will end farmer herder crisis. An Israel-Palestine conflict deepens as violent clashes between Israel and Gaza militants spread to war towns. <coughs> The Senator representing Bielsa West in the National Assembly, Seriake Dixon, is condemning the recent attacks on police facilities in the southeast and south-south parts of the country. He made the comments after a closed-door meeting with the Inspector General of Police, noting that Nigerians need to assist the police in fighting crime and criminality. Senator Dixon, who is a retired police officer, explains that the police in Nigeria deserve to be encouraged. This is a very trying period in the life of our country, and particularly for the police. And I thought that uh, I should be here uh, as a policeman that I always will be myself, uh, to show support, to show concern, to join in condemning these acts of aggression visited on law-abiding people just doing their best to protect citizens of our country. And I want to use that opportunity to call for, uh, to call for a cessation of all such attacks on police formations and police officers and men that is going on in some parts um, of our country. And to tell everybody that the police are not your problem. The police are not your enemies. Police officers and men are your brothers and sisters from across all parts of our country. The air components of Operation Thunderstrike say they have killed several bandits during an air raid in burning Gwari and Chikun local government areas of Kaduna State. The armed reconnaissance, according to the Kaduna State Commissioner for Internal Security and Home Affairs, Samuel Arawan, was conducted over six communities in neighboring Niger state, as well as Chikung and its environs. He explains that the bandits who fled on motorcycles were trailed by and subsequently neutralized. Similar operation was conducted along the Kaduna Abuja Expressway, Olam Farms and adjoining settlements where normal human activity and free flow of traffic is now being observed along the highway and the rail line. Airstrikes were also said to have been carried out at Burningwari local government area, while bandit camps were set ablaze. A police in Zamfara State have arrested five suspects involved in banditry, kidnapping, cattle rustling, and illegal possession of firearms. The suspects are said to have been terrorizing communities in Zamfara, Kaduna, Katsina, and Niger State. They were arrested, though they come through the efforts of the Federal Intelligence Investigations Bureau and Special Tactical Squad deployed by the Inspector General of Police to the state. Among them is a Nigerian citizen, Shehu Ali Kachala, a notorious gun runner who says he has been in the business for over three years and has sold close to 4,500 rifles to criminal gangs. 
Marcia Ideen. It is May 14th, 2021, a day that may sound like any other for you, but for Rebecca Sharibu, it's a day she remembers as her daughter Leah's birthday, but she could not celebrate it. And that's because Leah is in Boko Haram captivity. She was kidnapped four years ago and is yet to be released. I spoke to her mother about how life has been without her daughter and hopes of her return. For four years, Rebecca Sharibu has been without her daughter, Leah. Leah was among the 110 schoolgirls kidnapped by terror group Boko Haram from the Government Girls Science and Technology College in Dapchi on February 19, 2018. Five of the schoolgirls died on the same day of their kidnapping, but all others were released following the intervention of the Nigerian military, except Leah Sharibu and she was 14 years old at the time. Though promises have been made by the Nigerian federal government that it is working towards her release, four years on, Leah remains in captivity, now reportedly married with two children. Meeting her mother, I observe she's very nervous. Her words are few, yes. and she hardly makes eye contact. When we sit to talk, her words are calculated and hardly expressive. Hey, Augustia. To be honest, we are very sad about Leah's absence because when she was here, she would do all the house chores. Indeed, her absence makes me sad. What are some of the things that Leah would have been doing now? You know, she was abducted when she was 14, she was still very young not yet a woman, and also not a little girl. 14 years old when she was abducted, I would have taught her a couple of things and she would have continued her studies as well, especially against the background of the fact that she always said she wanted to be a doctor. Let's go back to the day when Leah was abducted and you heard that you know she was taken along with some of uh, her classmates. How did you feel? When she was around, she would do practically everything in the house. But when we heard of her abduction, we were greatly troubled. I wept profusely and even fainted. I had to be rushed to the hospital. At some point, her eyes well with tears, but they do not fall. She keeps her emotions locked in. Leah turns 18 on May 14. In many societies, this is the age a girl becomes a woman. But Leah has already been thrown prematurely into adulthood. She was pregnant, yes, we heard, as it was being speculated in the media that Leah has a child. But I've not seen it with my own eyes. Any time she's released and I see her, then I will believe and know her condition. And when you heard that other girls who were kidnapped alongside Leah were released, I'm sure your hopes were high that you would soon see your daughter. Having not seen her in four years, do you still think that the government is trying to bring her back? What I have to say to the government is that I want the president to fulfill his promise about the return of Leah to the people in general, especially those praying for Leah. I pray that God should continue to strengthen them. It has been four long years, but to Mrs. Rebecca Sharibu, her hope remains high that she will one day be reunited with her daughter. The fact that the whole world is praying for the return of Leah is why I'm hopeful that one day, as God pleases, Leah will return. I'll be very happy and thankful whenever she returns. Just in case Leah ever gets to see this interview, and she has to see her mother talk about her. What do you want her to know, even while she's in captivity? My advice to her is that she holds on to her faith to the very end. Leah is not Mrs. Sharibo's only child. She has a son who is schooling far from home for his own protection. Rebecca Sharibo has never stopped praying for her daughter's safety and return. She trusts God for the answers. Hopefully, faith and hope will cause her to find her smile again and unlock the happiness 
that seems non-existent in her heart. And the news of 10 returns, electoral materials destroyed as fire guts another INEC office. Uh, the third time in less than two weeks. Plus, Nigeria boosts natural gas development with $6.9 billion in investment deals in 2020. We'll have more in business news. Welcome back to the news at 10. In Yobong Omoring, the 26 year old job seeker who was allegedly killed by one Udwak Francis Akban in Akwaibom State has been buried amid tears and calls for justice in the murder. The burial is coming almost at the same time the police paraded the suspected killer who lured the girl to an unknown destination under the pretext of uh, offering her a job. Family members. Friends and colleagues of Inubongu Morin converged on a hometown in Nong Ita Ikoresian Uruk Anam local government area of Akwaibom State for the burial of the 26 year old job seeker, allegedly murdered by one Uduak Francis Akban on April the 29th, 2021. Her funeral service cut short by rain, her body is taken in a hearse to its final resting place, and it is at that point that reality dawned on sympathizers. And then the tears flowed freely as they couldn't hold themselves together. After the burial, some of her friends speak about her. I was expecting to come for a marriage. I did not expect to come for a burial, but it is well. Burial Studio is very, very intelligent. This can be seen in a recently published result. For a student in philosophy to have 4.1 or a CGPA of 4.12, you know what it means. It goes a long way to tell you that she was not somebody who would take her studies for granted. She was very studious and she was somebody who had so many friends. We all knew her in the campus. At all times, Inubo Humorin was always seen either in the library or in our classes. Elsewhere in the state capital, Uyo, the Akwaibom Police Command moved to deny reports making the rounds in the social media that the suspect responsible for her death had committed suicide while in custody. Addressing journalists while parading him and his father, the state commissioner of police says the suspect is in custody. The man who is said to be dead is sitting down here and maybe you'll be able to interact with him too. It's most unfortunate that the social media that is supposed to be an advantage to the police and to the, to the citizenry has become a tool that is being used to vilify even the police and the government. Meanwhile, the suspect and his father were also allowed to speak to journalists. I asked her whether she can work in a farm where her drugs are kept as a secretary. And she said that she can, that she's ready to do the job. So when she came, I revealed to her that this farm doesn't exist. You know, there's nothing, there's no farm like that. You know, it was just a hoax. I'm not happy about it, but uh, I believe that uh, the commissioner of police is working with his men and he has assured uh, Nigerians, he has assured Akwaibomite and the entire world that justice will take his cause. With Inubong now buried, the next step is for the police to do the needful by charging the suspects to court for the case to be settled once and for all. They try to wrap my head around that one. President Mahmoud Buhari has received the leader of Chad's traditional military council, General Muhammad Idris Debi, at the presidential villa. Now, at the meeting, which held behind closed doors, President Buhari pledged that Nigeria will assist the Republic of Chad to stabilize and return to constitutional order. The Minister of Foreign Affairs, Jeff Onyama, told State House correspondents that General Debi has pledged to return the country to civil rule in the next 18 months.
He explained the, um, that they were appointed as prime minister, the, um, the leader of the opposition who came second in the elections, and that uh, he has been charged with now organizing, uh, first of all, having an inclusive um, you know, governance process, uh, interim transitional governance process with all the you know, opposition leaders and, and you know, all the stakeholders, and uh, that over the next 18 months, uh, to then organize at the end of 18 months, uh, free, fair, democratic elections. And in the meantime, as the head of that transitional military council, uh, will be uh, um, Muhammad uh, um, Debi uh, Itno. Uh, he spoke about the importance of the international community and the United Nations taking their responsibility, disarming a lot of the mercenaries that had been used in um, to fight a proxy war uh, in Libya. And that a lot of those... Um, mercenaries are from sub-Saharan Africa, the Sahel region, and um, that they also should not be allowed to go back to their countries uh, with armed, with all those weapons, uh, very sophisticated weapons, and, um, you know, that they've had, and vehicles uh, that they've had, and that they've had 10 years of military experience, so that that would destabilize and continue to destabilize the sub-region if they are allowed to just return, sorry, with all the weapons and things that they have. We'll stay a bit more in Abuja because Terry is standing by with more on the news at 10. Hi, Terry. Hello, Amarachi. The Independent National Electoral Commission's office in Udenu local government area of Enugu State has been gutted by fire. Police Public Relations Officer of the Enugu Command, Daniel Ndukwe, says preliminary investigations suggest that the fire, which has been put out, may have been caused by a power surge. According to him, the level of damage cannot be immediately quantified, but the area has been cordoned off and a thorough investigation launched to ascertain the actual cause of the fire. This is the third incident involving INEX local government offices in three states in less than two weeks. The others are in Esenudim local government area of Akwaibom State and Ohafia local government area of Abia State. Well, there appears to be no end in sight to the leadership crisis rocking the Federal Civil Service retirees, as both the dissolved executive committee led by Mr. Sunday Omize and the caretaker committee of the same body set up by the National Union of Pensioners claim to be in charge of the association. The chairman of the caretaker committee, Mr. Frederick Egwaba, says members of the Federal Civil Service retirees had at no time decided to pull out of the NUP. But Mr. Omize insists that the federal civil service retirees got their autonomy from the Ministry of Labor and Employment since 2018. Chairman of the caretaker committee of the Federal Civil Service Retirees addressing journalists at a news conference in Abuja. He wants to clear the air on a publication by a faction of the association led by the former chairman, Mr. Sunday Omize, who claims that the Federal Civil Service retirees are no longer part of the National Union of Pensioners. To put the record straight, retirees of the Federal Civil Service branch have not and do not intend to opt out of NUP to register another trade union as claimed by the dissolved and the disgruntled escorts of the Federal Civil Service Pensioner Branch. From the day of their dissolution, they have lost the right to continue to lord it over the Federal Civil Service Pensioners. Some members of the Federal Civil Service retirees have been clamoring for autonomy from the National Union of Pensioners, an agitation the former chairman of the association says they got approval for in 2018. We have been agitating for our autonomy until finally, on the 18th of July 2018, we are able to get our autonomy. After the Minister of Labor queried them, this is the query. The query is here. Query them. They said they dissolved us in National Delegate Conference and set up a critical committee, which Minister of Labor wrote to them that we should maintain status quo. 
The leadership struggle between the former executive committee of the Federal Civil Service retirees and the caretaker committee is made worse as Mr. Omize alleges a misappropriation of over one billion naira dues collected from its members in four years. The Adamawa state government has cleared the air over the 100 billion naira bond loan it has issued following concerns in some quarters in the state. The clarification was given by the state commissioner of finance in an interview with Channels Television in Yola, the Adamawa state capital. According to the finance commissioner, the 100 billion naira bond size is the amount to be registered with the Nigerian Stock Exchange to be used in financing some investment projects that will help improve the economy of the state and address other liabilities in inherited from previous administrations in the state. In the first instance for this year, we are drawing 25 billion, which will be used to servicing the existing debt, finance the agribusiness, provide infrastructural development, such as social investment, and then perhaps reduce the liability of pension that we have, so that we can be uh, PENCOM compliant. This is the instance. Then next year, we, can, we will now draw another 25 billion and free the FAC ISPO that has been issued so that our FAC or Federation Allocation Fund will be free as well. Now with that, if there is no need for assessing the other balance of 50 billion, we will not go for it because we are expecting an increase, momentum increase in our revenue as a result of the agro-business. When that is coming, we will not see the need to go for the 100 billion. So we just want to register the 100 billion bond size in the uh, stock market. Well, that's all from Abuja. Business News is next with Kayode Okikiolu. Banking so easy, so simple. Dial star 894 hash now to experience it. You first, first bank. Well, thank you, Terry. The World Bank says Nigeria has reported four natural gas projects worth a total of $6.9 billion in 2020, driving development through the country's gas master plan. According to its private participation and in infrastructure report, the investment commitments have been on in the last five years, mainly from China as a foreign sponsor. The report adds that the $2.6 billion Ajakuta Kaduna Kano pipeline launched last year is among the four big ticket natural gas infrastructure projects across the country. The production of smart card readers can now be done in Nigeria, thanks to a collaboration between the Bank of Industry and partners in the telecommunications and financial sector. According to the Managing Director of Secure ID, Mrs. Kofo Akinkugwe, the fully functional smart card manufacturing facility has an estimated production capacity of 200 million units. Meanwhile, the Bank of Industry has been explaining the role it has played in the initiative since inception. The era of producing smart cards abroad is now a thing of the past as the Bank of Industry and other partners have brought to reality Nigeria's first smart card manufacturing company, Secure ID Limited. With the primary objective of manufacturing and deploying smart cards and a host of other chip integrated cards, Secure ID has become a market leader in sub Saharan Africa. This is a major game changer in Nigeria's smart card industry as it is expected to address the demand for foreign exchange as well as service the local market. A major financier of the initiative is the Bank of Industry, and its attraction to this pioneer initiative is an indication that the bank is poised to scale up its support to drive economic growth. We will continue to support Secure ID. Uh, I can make that commitment on behalf of the MD who has asked me to say that, that even if they want more than what we have given them put together times two, and we will continue to support them. Industries like ourselves need to continue to be encouraged as it takes supernatural grace, it takes courage and boldness to pioneer value in our nation. Vice President Yemi Oshibajo restates the role being played by the federal government in ensuring that innovative startups can have a friendly business environment. 
This will mean our retooling our business environment for greater competitiveness, especially with the takeoff of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. We are rethinking our tax regimes. We are trying to sort out external and internal trade issues, getting our regulatory authorities, SON, NAFDAQ, and even customs to see their roles more as business facilitators than policemen or merely revenue generators. As Nigeria embraces full digitization, the support of financial institutions in ensuring market participation through availability of funds remain imperative. And now to the local equities market, where trading activities resumed on a positive note after the Edo Fitri holidays, as the NGX All Share Index closes the week at 0.72%. Uvia Bikomo tells us more. In line with traders' expectations, the local equities market closed Friday's trading session in the green, sustaining its rebound for a third consecutive day within the second week of the month. Yes, you can say the bull has done it again, another half a percent rise in the market's benchmark index, which translates to more than 51 billion naira in total value that came largely on the back of continued but mild interest for some equities across all sectors of the market except oil and gas counters, which ended unchanged. At the same time, the volume of equities transactions carried out today was slightly lower against Tuesday's session as 219.54 million shares worth nearly 3 billion naira changed hands in 4,107 deals after financial markets resumed from the Eid holiday. The market has lived up to positive expectations this week, but let's keep our fingers crossed for its reaction in the coming week as we look forward to a batch of first quarter earnings and latest inflation numbers. That's all for your stock market report. I'm Uvie Bicomo. Thanks, Uvie. Outside Nigeria, stocks in the U.S. closed positive on the back of tech shares and reopening trades after recording steep losses this week. Well, let's take a look at Friday's closing numbers for other global markets. Business news for tonight. Thanks for watching. The news at 10 continues with Amarachi. Banking so easy, so simple. Dial star 894 hash now to experience it. You first, first bank. Thanks, Kyle At least 122 people have been killed in Gaza and eight in Israel since fighting began between Israeli military and Palestinian militants. Some of the heaviest exchanges of fire between the two were experienced today, despite intense talks with international mediators continuing. The fighting has now spread to the West Bank, where 10 Palestinians have been reported dead. Simon Pusey has more in international news around the world in five. Good evening and welcome to the Channel Studios here in London with your international news around the world in five. Israel has intensified its assault on Gaza as Palestinian militants continue to fire rockets into Israel on the fifth day of hostilities. Israel's military said air and ground forces were involved in attacks on Friday but had not entered Gaza. Video from Gaza City showed the night sky lit up by explosions from Israeli artillery, gunboats and airstrikes. Some 119 people have been killed in Gaza and eight have died in Israel since fighting began on Monday. International medical aid has poured into India as countries continue to help the South Asian nation with its coronavirus infections crisis. An aircraft carrying ventilators, medicines and other medical equipment from Germany, Netherlands and Portugal landed in the Indian capital early on Friday morning. Other aircraft from Qatar and South Korea carrying shipments of oxygen concentrators, ventilators, rapid testing kits and negative pressure carriers also arrived to help. 
The next phase of lockdown easing in England will go ahead from Monday, despite growing concern over the variant of the virus from India. Latest figures show there were 1,313 cases of the variant in the UK, up from the 520 recorded the previous week. From the 17th of May, pubs and restaurants will be allowed to reopen indoors and people will be allowed to mix indoors as two households or under the rule of six. A major U.S. fuel pipeline has reportedly paid cybercriminal gang Darkside nearly $5 million in ransom payments following a cyber attack. Colonial Pipeline suffered a ransomware cyber attack over the weekend and took its service down for five days, causing supplies to tighten across the U.S. Several American media sources reported the ransom has been paid. Colonial said it would not comment on the issue. Black Brazilians have been demonstrating in the country's two largest cities to protest against racism and police violence towards their communities in a local version of the Black Lives Matter movement in the United States, with some accusing the country's president of genocide. It's after the shooting dead of 28 people in a slum on the outskirts of Rio de Janeiro a week ago during an operation that police said targeted drug traffickers. Human rights activists accused the police of extrajudicial killings. El Salvador is set to donate 34,000 doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine to neighboring Honduras following an appeal from Honduran mayors. A host of Latin American nations are receiving Chinese vaccines, but Honduras and Guatemala are not in line to receive them. Honduran President Juan Orlando Hernandez has said the country could open a trade office in China in a bid to acquire coronavirus vaccines. Five high court judges in Kenya have blocked a government-backed plan to make fundamental changes to the country's constitution. The judges said the Constitution Amendment Bill, popularly referred to as the Building Bridges Initiative, was irregular, illegal and unconstitutional. Global geopolitics. The judgment is arguably the most significant ruling by Kenyan courts since President Uhuru Kenyatta's election win was nullified in 2017. Japan is set to declare states of emergency in three more prefectures on the same day that a petition to cancel the games was submitted to organizers. Hokkaido, Okiyama and Hiroshima will join Tokyo, Osaka and four other prefectures enforcing stricter lockdown measures, which will last until the end of May. The petition received more than 350,000 signatures in just nine days and says money spent on the games should be spent helping people and families rebuild after the pandemic. And finally, theatres and performing arts centres across the UK are preparing to open again on Monday, with this production of Amélie set to begin again from the 17th. It has been over a year since the production was on stage in London, and as England takes the next step out of lockdown, the musical, based on the hit 2001 French film, will be one of the first to open in the capital's West End. It's the last show. Uh, that most of us have done before this madness happened, and so it's a it's a it's a great way to to, to get back to a version, a different version of the life before before 2020. And that's your international news around the world in five. Now back to the Channel Studios in Lagos. Many thanks, Simon. Super Eagles head coach Gennett Rohr has unveiled a provisional squad list of 31 players for Nigeria's international friendly against AFCON host the Indomitable Lions of Cameroon. The friendly will hold on June the 4th in Vienna. Firenze of Portugal forward Abraham Marcus is the newest face in the squad, while four players from the Nigeria Professional Football League were also called up. The provisional list of 31 will be reduced to 23 before the three-time African Champions League for Vienna for the game. FIFA has confirmed that Manchester City FC defender Emmerich Laporte has been approved to play for Spain instead of France at the Euro Championships. The news comes after the 26-year-old defender who spent eight years at Athletic Bilbao was granted Spanish nationality earlier this week. Born in France, he was called up three times for the World Champions but never actually made it onto the pitch. The Portuguese government has announced that English fans attending the Champions League final in Porto between Man City and Chelsea will have to fly in and out of the country on the day of the match. The government says they will also need to stay in a bubble while in the city. UEFA has already stated that 6,000 fans from each club will be able to attend the final come May the 29th. 
Argentine Hector Cooper has been appointed as the new coach of DR Congo men's football team. The 65-year-old tactician has been given the task of leading the Leopards to the 2022 FIFA World Cup. DR Congo, who missed out on a place at next year's Africa Nations Cup finals, are in a group with Madagascar, Benin and Tanzania for the second round of qualifying for the World Cup. And that sports news is back to Marachi for the round. And the main news again. Parents of 20 abducted students of Greenfield University, Kaduna, again cried for help today and appealed to the government to assist them in rescuing their children from captivity. Also today, in Morning, the victim of a job scam was buried in her hometown in Akwaibom State as police berated her suspected killer. That is the news at 10 tonight. Thanks for watching. I'm Amarachi Ubani. Good night. <laughs>